undoubtedly one of the most hyped Super Famicom role-playing games that never reached North American shores was Star Ocean. Created by Triace and published by Enix in 1996, the game has won a great deal of acclaim and has spawned a series of popular sequels. The team that created the game still exists to this day and continues to make games. Published at the very tail end of the Super Famicom's run, Star Ocean features some of the best graphics of any game on the platform and utilizes the SDD-1 chip to aid in the compression of graphics. The sprite actions in battle are especially impressive. The game was fairly successful in Japan, selling about 235,000 copies. Due to poor sales though, in North America, Enix stopped publishing all games for the Super Nintendo by the end of 1995. Star Ocean did receive an unofficial fan translation patch in 2003, however. The translation was highly anticipated and allowed a new group of enthusiasts to experience the game for the first time. Those that have played Tales of Fantasia may recognize a lot of similarities between that game and Star Ocean. This is for good reason. Most of the development team that worked on Tales of Fantasia, Wolf Team, left Namco in 1994 citing creative disputes between the developers and publisher. The development team founded Triace in 1995 and began work on Star Ocean shortly thereafter, and the rest is history. The story begins with Radix, Dorn, and Millie, a group of felpool creatures with tails on the undeveloped planet of Roke. Soon, a disease is turning all inhabitants in a neighboring town to stone. Dorn and Millie's father contract the disease while searching for a cure. As Radix, Dorn, and Millie search for a remedy as well, two members of the Earth Federation, Renixis and Iria, suddenly appear. They inform the team that the disease was sent from a foreign power that the Earth Federation is at war with. Dorn eventually turns to stone. It is determined that the only vaccine for the disease is with its original source a demon that was killed 300 years in the past. Renixis and Iria venture to a time gate, sending the group 300 years into the past on planet Roke in hopes of finding a cure. Perhaps the most fun part of Star Ocean is the battle system. Instead of a turn-based game, battles in Star Ocean are more action-oriented. Each character can either perform special attacks or magic. Characters with special attacks can assign abilities to the L and R buttons, and the special attack execution is different depending on the character's distance from a targeted enemy. The special attack system truly adds a unique dimension that isn't present in most RPGs. The relative power of the special attacks varies greatly. Some seem extremely slow and nearly useless, while others seem incredibly powerful. For instance, Marvel's Hail Orb can be spammed repeatedly and destroys almost everything. You can also set battlefield formations to alter the aggressiveness of your party, which adds a bit of customization to help in some circumstances. Unfortunately, the AI for the characters you aren't controlling isn't the greatest, and sometimes it causes them to behave erratically. This is actually one of my only criticisms about the game. Also, the main storyline of the game is fairly easy. Some bosses will give you trouble, but most of them can be beaten by the same attacks over and over again until dead. Another qualm I have with the game is that it's plainly too short. A typical blind playthrough of the game lasts only about 20 hours. However, the game does offer a lot of bonus material, such as an incredibly challenging multi-level bonus dungeon that adds significant replay value. Also, characters can level all the way up to 255. Another of the game's interesting features is the skill system. After leveling up, characters receive a certain number of skill points that can be allocated to various skills, which allow them to become more powerful in battle or more proficient at item creation, among other things. This is another fun facet of the game that separates it from other RPGs and provides an incentive to the player to level their skills up to max. In towns, the party can split up separately to reveal special dialogue in sequences known as private actions. This opens up some additional storyline segments and special items. I don't find this facet of the game terribly exciting, but it is definitely unique. Another unique aspect of the game is the item creation system, which allows the player to create weapons, armor, and other items from base materials. 
Far from being inconsequential, some of the most powerful weapons and armor in the game are unlocked via the item creation system. The soundtrack is quite good, but some of the tracks can get pretty repetitive over the course of the game. The score is fitting, but it isn't nearly as diverse as something like Final Fantasy VI or Chrono Trigger. The voice acting in battle sequences is completely unique, and adds a lot to the battle experience. Direction can be odd in the game. Instead of an overworld map, you venture through open areas much like you would through towns, but there are random battles in these places as well. This can make it tough to remember your way or to navigate. The game was remade in 2008 on the PlayStation Portable and dubbed Star Ocean The First Departure. The remake included several changes, including new content and a new world map instead of utilizing the series of passageways from city to city. The game looks and plays almost exactly like Star Ocean The Second Story, which changes the battles quite a bit from the 2D counterparts in Star Ocean for the Super Famicom. Overall, Star Ocean is one of my favorite RPGs on the Super Famicom. It doesn't possess a story as good as Final Fantasy VI or a soundtrack as good as Chrono Trigger, but it certainly is worth playing if you like the genre. The bonus dungeon, item creation, battle system, and different possible character combinations makes the game extremely fun to play and gives the game some replay value that can't be found in other RPGs. One of my absolute favorite RPGs came out in the middle of 1996, just as my favorite console at the time, the SNES, was fading out of the limelight. I only had one major issue with Star Ocean, the game that captured so much of my attention back then. It was only released in Japan, and I only had a very basic understanding of it at the time. I played the English translated ROM that appeared a few years later, and enjoyed it in every way. It honestly became one of my favorite RPGs on the system, and it still is. As I turned my attention to the Sony PlayStation, though, and all the great RPGs it offered, I was beyond excited to learn that a sequel to Star Ocean was to be released in 1999. Like the original, Star Ocean The Second Story was developed by Triace, the same company that split off from Wolf Team and created Tales of Fantasia. Star Ocean The Second Story was also later released on the PlayStation Portable as Star Ocean Second Evolution, a remastered version that contained voice acting, new skills, new cutscenes, new endings, and even a new playable character. Accordingly, this video contains footage from both versions of the game. Like the first Star Ocean game, the second story is greatly influenced by Star Trek and science fiction in general. The story takes place 20 years after the original Star Ocean game, and unlike almost every other RPG out there, you actually choose from one of two lead protagonists at the beginning of the game. One of them, Claude C. Kenny, is the son of Ronix J. Kenny from the first Star Ocean title. Under Claude's first mission for the Earth Federation, he is sent to survey a planet, where he discovers a mysterious machine that teleports him to the planet Expel. There, he meets Rena, a girl who mistakes him for a legendary hero of light that is prophesized by her people. So yeah, at the beginning of the game you actually select which character, Claude or Rena, you wish to control as the lead protagonist. On the surface, it seems like this decision doesn't matter much, since the general storyline unfolds similarly regardless of your choice. However, it does make quite a bit of difference in regard to character recruitment because Claude can recruit some characters that Rena can't, and vice versa. Most of the storyline revolves around Claude, Rena, and their friends who investigate a meteorite that crashed into Expel, which seems to have produced a swarm of monsters. In the process, they uncover an interplanetary scheme of global domination that threatens themselves and life on Expel. It's definitely along the same lines of themes you'll find in the other Star Ocean games, which makes it stand out a bit from the purely fantasy-oriented RPGs the series is often compared to. Another thing that stands out about Star Ocean The Second Story, and I mean really stands out compared to most RPGs, is its battle system. Unlike most turn-based RPGs, this one uses an innovative form of action RPG gameplay where combat takes place in real time and you can continue selecting menu commands from a single character while up to three other characters in your party are controlled by artificial intelligence. Also, unlike the original Star Ocean for Super Famicom, this one puts your characters into a 3D battlefield. 
Also noteworthy is the special attacks, also known as killer moves, which really distinguish the fighter characters from each other. New killer moves are gained at specific levels, and can be bound to the L and R buttons. Each are different, and consume varying amounts of magic points. What's more is that the more times you use the killer moves too, the more they improve in power and take on new qualities. Take Claude's Ripper Blast for example. At first, this attack forces a single line of jagged boulders to strike enemies, but after it's used enough times, the lines get wider and function as a frontal cone attack that has a much bigger range. The vast majority of killer moves follows the same pattern, where the attack itself evolves as you use it. This advancement system was incredibly satisfying. It allowed your characters to progress both in terms of statistical increases at level up, and also in tangible ways through the killer moves themselves. In terms of RPGs, this system really separates the Star Ocean games from the pack. Outside of the fighter characters, there's also a different type of character altogether that instead gains symbology, the ability to cast targeted spells. These caster characters generally sit back at a distance and take more time to generate each spell, and gain a variety of different types of magic as they level. For instance, Rena is a total healer, Selene casts a variety of offensive elemental spells, and Noel is a jack-of-all-trades caster. It's certainly fun to experiment with not only different combinations of characters, but also different AI settings to see what works best. Generally speaking, I think it's best to control Claude. You can only control one character at a time, but you can toggle between them to ensure you do the ability you wish. The behavior of the characters you aren't controlling is dictated through AI modes that you set in the user interface. One thing I have to mention is that unless you're familiar with the Star Ocean series, and maybe even if you are, the voice acting in this game will drive you crazy. Each individual special attack produces an audible voice clip, many of which are very cheesy. So if you keep spamming your best abilities, you'll continue to hear the same ones over and over and over. Just check this out. It can be a bit comical at first, but you're likely to grow tired of it after a while. Some of them are cornier than others, and if you continue to use the same characters, I can see how it could drive you to madness. It's not unlike the other games in the series in this way, though. Even beyond the battle system, Star Ocean The Second Story is filled with innovations that the whole franchise is known for. One of them is item creation, a system through which you can build powerful armor, weapons, and other items with reagents you find throughout the game. Unlike other titles where similar mechanics can provide a fun but moderate advantage, in this one, some of the very most powerful weapons and armor can only be created in this way. It's truly different than any other item creation system I've ever seen. Also, the skill system stands out as a fun way to customize the progression of your character. Throughout your journey, you gain skill points that can be allocated to a whole array of different types of skills. Some that provide combat upgrades, some that assist in improving your item creation, and some that provide stat increases. You can buy new skill sets at skill guilds, and this adds a new layer to advancement beyond leveling and killer move progression. You also have the ability to engage in private actions in towns, the ability to split your party up and explore, and sometimes discover bonus storyline content or find special items. It just adds that much more flavor and lore to the experience. The soundtrack of Star Ocean The Second Story, just like the first title, was composed by Motoi Sakuraba, now a legend in his industry. It expands on the style of high-tempo electronic sounds he is known for, but also throws in a few slower, more somber tracks as well. Star Ocean Forever stands as an uplifting theme of sorts for the game, whereas the venerable forest captures the emotional side of the score. Another track, Integral Body and Imperfect Soul, serves as a fantastic song for the final boss encounter. If there's one thing that really annoys me about Star Ocean The Second Story, it's how long it takes for offensive spells to cast. Some of these spells, especially Leon's and Selene's, take incredibly long amounts of time to complete their animations. I get they are just trying to make these spells a visual spectacle, but man, 
it just gets to be way too much. Because the spellcasters just aren't as powerful as the fighter characters anyway, this issue makes me want to use them even less than I otherwise would have. When it comes down to it, Star Ocean the Second Story provides an unforgettable experience and is definitely one of the best RPGs on the PlayStation. It combines a solid story and fun characters with gameplay that will blow your expectations away. The skill system and combat will reel you in, and the title even includes a super challenging bonus dungeon that provides yet another avenue to pour many hours into it. I can't say I like it quite as much as the original Star Ocean game, but it's definitely my second favorite, and many fans consider it to be the very best of the franchise. If you're a big RPG fan like me, chances are high that you already know a lot about the Star Ocean series. You probably played Star Ocean The Second Story, Star Ocean Till the End of Time, and Star Ocean The Last Hope. But chances are also high that you haven't played Star Ocean Blue Sphere. This is because Star Ocean Blue Sphere was released on the Game Boy Color exclusively in Japan, and it was never translated or localized for North American or European audiences. According to reports, this was because Enix no longer wanted to publish games for the dying Game Boy Color at the tail end of its life cycle, and they didn't want to devote resources to port the game to the Game Boy Advance, which was new at the time. And even though the title was a lot different than the other Star Ocean games, it's really gone unnoticed and overlooked by the fanbase. In this video, I'm going to explain why that's the case and give you all my thoughts and impressions on Star Ocean Blue Sphere. The good, the bad, and the ugly. Before I dive into all that though, please like this video and subscribe to my channel for more retro gaming content and classic RPG reviews. So you probably noticed that I told you that Star Ocean Blue Sphere wasn't localized or translated, even though I'm clearly including video of the game with English text. So are you calling me a liar? Well if you were, I guess you're right because I kind of am. The title was never officially localized, but it was translated in unofficial capacity by the good folks at List Translations, and the footage here comes from that version. As usual, I'll include a link to the patch in the description below if you want to give it a try. Star Ocean Blue Sphere actually served as the direct sequel to Star Ocean The Second Story for the PlayStation, and takes place two years after the events in that one. And this is pretty evident from the get-go because you recruit and play as the same exact characters. When you fire up the game, the squad is searching for Ernest and Opera, who sent out an SOS signal after their ship crashes on a planet called Edifice. As the party goes looking for them though, they're sucked into the atmosphere of the planet and crash land themselves, so they decide to explore on foot. Also, they all hope Claude and Rena will eventually come to rescue them, so you don't start out with either of them. As you get going with the gameplay, you're allowed to choose any party of three characters to form your party, but the other two characters aren't very important because they'll be AI controlled. I recommend picking Dias or Ashton as your main character because both are very powerful close combat fighters. Unlike the other Star Ocean games, enemies actually appear on the screen and you get into battle when you run into them. There is movement in combat like all the other games in the series, but it actually plays out much more like a Tails game than a Star Ocean game. And this is because the movement is really confined to a two-dimensional left-right style rather than the series' traditional 3D approach. Game Boy Color hardware limitations are clearly seen here. To do regular attacks you press A, but you can string together combos if you continue to press A just as you land attacks. It's kind of like Super Mario RPG in this way, and supposedly you can get combos of up to 99 hits if you're good enough. I never was though. Another interesting thing is that the enemies have several health bars that represent different body parts, and this is new for the franchise as well. When you defeat the individual body parts, it disables the enemies in certain ways. For example, some enemies will be unable to perform certain attacks against you when this occurs. I didn't experiment a lot with this though, so I'm not sure the extent to which the encounters change. Items can be used with the select button, and special attacks or spells are used by pressing B button and up, down, left, or right. 
You also don't gain levels, you instead earn SP which can be used on skills. It works almost exactly like the skill system in the first few Star Ocean games. And I have to say, this truly was the fun part of the experience. It was the single thing that made me feel like I was playing a Star Ocean game. There's a big variety of skills here too, with four overarching skill types. Combat, Sensibility, Knowledge, and Technical. Spending skill points in certain areas also unlocks new branches of skills, and it's super fun to tailor your character to grow them the way you want. One thing to note though is that the SP is actually pooled among all three characters instead of being earned individually, so I would spend most of them on the character you plan to play in combat the most. This framework also plays into the special attack system too. This is because new special attacks and spells are learned by leveling certain combinations of skills, where each special attack has specific prerequisites. And there's actually a fair variety here. I was impressed by the sheer number of spells for the spellcasters especially. One interesting fact too is that each of the characters have unique map-only abilities that differentiate them from each other. For instance, Noel is able to use an enemy analysis power that gives you intel about enemies you find in the wild. Ashton can breathe fire from a distance, and Dias can dash, which was extremely useful in getting around from place to place quickly. There doesn't seem to be a world map of any kind though, so you'll definitely have to do a lot of guess and check exploration along the way. As far as the soundtrack goes, Motoi Sakuraba gave us one of the greatest soundtracks that ever existed on the Game Boy Color with Star Ocean Blue Sphere. And man, the sound quality of the hardware is rough, but his trademark style still manages to shine through. He certainly did a lot with the hurdles here. I especially enjoyed the main theme, Star Ocean Forever, the battle song called Hand to Hand, and a tune called The Surface of the Blue Sphere that plays toward the beginning of the game. The downside is that there's only 29 tracks, which is a bit disappointing considering the length of the game, but I guess they needed all that extra space to pack in the enormous amount of content this game has. So it's definitely a respectable contribution as far as Game Boy Color soundtracks go, but the quality of the sound itself doesn't hold up at all, and I'd never listen to it on its own like I would for games on the PlayStation or even the SNES at times. And speaking of all the content, the length of this game is really something incredible for the platform. A complete playthrough will take you over 20 hours, which is almost unheard of when it comes to Game Boy Color standards. I have to admit I found most of the game very easy though. There were some hard hitting enemies that you have to dodge a lot of attacks from, but a lot of it comes down to button mashing and stringing together combos that don't even allow your adversaries the chance to hit you. Unfortunately for us Star Ocean freaks, I don't think that Star Ocean Blue Sphere meets the expectations that fans had for it. Trice tried to pack a grandiose experience into a cartridge that really couldn't handle everything they wanted it to do. It's honestly kind of crazy how much content they crammed into this game, considering it was on the Game Boy Color, and the graphics and sound are far beyond almost everything you can find on the system. I thought the skills system and exploration is a lot of fun, but the gameplay just isn't as enjoyable as the other games in the series. It really gets monotonous at times. So if you're a Star Ocean purist, I think you'll like Blue Sphere more than most, but people that don't like it as much can probably leave this one fade into the shadows of RPG obscurity. As far as I'm concerned, Star Ocean Till the End of Time was the perfect game at the perfect time, at least for me. I was such a huge fan of its predecessor, Star Ocean The Second Story, and also the original Star Ocean on the Super Famicom. So when 2004 came around, I couldn't wait to pop this one into my PlayStation 2 and try it out. In this video, I'll leave you with all my memories from it and let you know if I think it stood the test of time almost 20 years later. But before I do that, please like the video and subscribe for more retro gaming content. To my great surprise and excitement, Tri-Ace didn't revolutionize the series through Star Ocean till the end of time. And when you think about it now, this was a big deal. Square made several changes to the Final Fantasy franchise through the release of Final Fantasy X, 
and many old school RPG franchises were shifting to newer 3D styles with different modern gameplay mechanics. With Star Ocean till the end of time though, the most redeemable facets from the previous two Star Ocean games were retained. The most noteworthy of these in my mind was the battle system. Combat was a unique turn-based action gameplay hybrid, where the player could move around the battlefield at will, execute special attacks, and cast spells. The biggest change to the combat was that this one did go down to three characters instead of the traditional four, which did disappoint me at the time, but the game does seem sufficiently balanced around it. This one also adds a visible fury bar that fills up as you fight enemies, and you have regular attacks with the X button, and strong attacks with the circle button. You gain cancel bonuses by timing your strong attacks to break the enemy's defenses, and this allows you to unload with other attacks. The Fury Gauge is used to string together special attacks into combos, much like how the special attack links worked in the previous two Star Ocean games. I really enjoyed these new innovations, and my only complaint was that the battle camera doesn't always make it easy to follow what's happening. That's the thing about combat that I don't think is held up that well after almost 20 years. The best part of the battles to me is the damage numbers that spurt out from the enemy each time you hit them. This is extremely satisfying, and as you gain power and do more damage, it really gives you a sense of advancement. It's the little things like this that Star Ocean Till the End of Time does so well, and it makes this type of action RPG combat so immersive. Like always, the characters announce each and every attack they do, which you'll definitely come to expect if you've ever played the Star Ocean series. It's a fact that lovers of the series love, and haters of the series hate, but if you play this game, you'll just have to deal with it either way. It's unavoidable, but it's Star Ocean. As far as the story goes, you take on the role of Fate Line God, a student at the Bakhtine Science University. His father is an expert in the field of symbological genetics, a fact that doesn't seem too important at first, but completely shapes a lot of the game's story. The game kicks off when Fate's family takes a vacation on the planet Haida 4 with Fate's childhood friend Sophia. However, their joy is soon interrupted by an attack by an alien force. The populace attempts to evacuate, and Fate is separated from his parents as he and Sophia are attacked once again on an escape ship. Fate escapes in the nick of time through an escape pod, and crash lands on the underdeveloped planet of Vanguard 3. Now if you played the other Star Ocean games, you might expect this is where most of the story will take place, but Fate actually manages to use the help of two Anti-Federation leaders, Cliff and Mirage, to get to another undeveloped planet called Elecor 2. This is where most of the story takes place, but you definitely get a lot of futuristic science fiction thrown in as the game progresses. The characters are more or less cut from a similar cloth from the other Star Ocean games, and like the previous two entries in the series, your choices during the storyline affect which characters you actually recruit. Unfortunately, this also means you can't recruit all characters in a single playthrough, so you really have to make difficult choices at times. Pepita, Nell, Albel, and Roger are all optional characters, and you can only get two out of those four. I always liked using Cliff and Maria alongside Fate simply because their special attacks seem the most powerful, and I like their storyline arcs. Private actions are back, and that's where your party splits up in towns. Doing this allows you to encounter new storyline segments, build relationships between characters, and even discover unique items that aren't available otherwise. There are over 50 possible private actions in total that you can do, and they're packed with tons of content that really gives this game a sheer sense of depth that other RPGs don't have. The key thing that the player relationships affect is the ending system, because Star Ocean Till the End of Time has 19 total endings, each of which is determined by the choices you make between characters. This will give the most hardcore players a lot of replay value, and creates outcomes based on your choices. And to me, that's something just about every RPG should do in the first place as a baseline. The item creation system that plays such a big role in the Star Ocean games is also back and this time it's more important than ever. You have alchemy, engineering, compounding, cooking, crafting, smithery, and writing. Just like in the previous entries, the game offers little guidance in terms of how to create the most powerful items, but it does encourage experimentation and research. 
So this isn't just some continually used gimmick, it's an integral part of the game that yields some of the strongest weapons and armor. Now it's true that you'll probably need a strategy guide to figure out how exactly to make the strongest weapons, but that fact stands true nonetheless. Series mainstay Motoi Sakuraba put together yet another fantastic soundtrack for this one, and since he's been such a big part of the series from the start, his style fits the adventure extremely well. His trademark fast and upbeat tracks are still present here, but I found that this score offers a lot more variety than past Star Ocean games. There's some somber emotional tracks, and there's also some jazzier, funkier tracks. There's even some heavy metal guitars at times. All this definitely adds a touch that wasn't present before. All around, it's a great soundtrack of over 80 songs and a definite highlight of the experience. Now, all fans of the Star Ocean games know that there'll be bonus dungeons, and that's no different here. But what's so great in this one is that you don't just get one in this game, you actually get two. So yeah, you have the Maze of Tribulations, which functions like the bonus dungeons in the previous Star Ocean games, but after defeating the boss of that one, you also get full access to Sphere 211, a new set of 110 floors that are packed full of items, special bosses, and other surprises. It's really incredible how much extra content this provides, especially on top of all the private actions and item creation mechanics you can do. When it comes down to it, Star Ocean Till the End of Time is one of the very best RPGs on the PlayStation 2. It didn't reinvent the wheel or revolutionize the series in any major way, and I actually think it's to the game's great credit that it didn't. In fact, I think the game possesses many of the same qualities that can be found in some of the greatest RPGs out there. Good characters, an interesting story, a fun combat system, and loads of extra content. There's even a huge, monumental plot twist in the game that makes you have to rethink everything that happened prior, and that was a bold choice that I think paid off. The vast item creation mechanics and bonus dungeons really pack a lot of extra value into the game, and it's easy to get lost in it all. The total size of this game is honestly pretty impressive, but it can be a little intimidating. I'd say it's the perfect RPG for people who need to see, do, and collect everything. It may even be the biggest and most complex RPG ever released for a home console. My only true critique is that some of the special attacks are much, much more powerful than others, so I ended up using a lot of the same ones at the end of the game. One of them is Maria's Energy Burst, which isn't found until the Maze of Tribulations, but it's just crazy powerful. Even so, the process of testing out different attacks and finding the best ones for all the characters was a heck of a lot of fun. Many Star Ocean fans rank this one among the best in the series, and I can see why. I personally don't like it quite as much as the first two, but it's still a great game in its own right, and it's Star Ocean to the core. So it's definitely worth playing if you missed out on it back then, and it's absolutely a top 10 RPG on the PlayStation 2. All of us who grew up with console gaming absolutely missed out on a few of our favorite titles simply because we couldn't justify buying the platform they were on. For example, no matter how much I wanted to, I never owned a Neo Geo and I didn't own a Sega Saturn until long after it was fashionable, so it just killed me that I couldn't play Samurai Shodown 2 or Dragon Force at home. It really sucked having our friends tell us about how much fun these games were, only to never get to play them for ourselves. It was so frustrating. Well, one of those games for me was Star Ocean The Last Hope. This was because, much to my discontent, Tri-Ace and Square Enix broke from tradition and decided to publish it on the Xbox 360 rather than the PlayStation 3 as I had expected. And the Xbox 360 was where it stayed, at least at first. Apparently, a lot of others had the same problem I did, so Square Enix eventually brought it to the PlayStation 3 in 2010. This version was called Star Ocean The Last Hope International, which even had some bonus content. But was Star Ocean The Last Hope all it was hyped up to be? Before I assess the game and answer that question, please like the video and subscribe to my channel for more retro gaming content. Even though it came out seven years after Star Ocean Till the End of Time, combat in Star Ocean The Last Hope is really quite similar to that one outside of a few adjustments. The first, and most significant I think, 
is that the game went back to traditional four-character parties rather than the three-character parties of Star Ocean till the end of time. I welcomed this change with open arms, because I just thought four-character parties from the first two Star Ocean games worked best. Having one character dedicated to healing allowed you to basically do whatever you wanted with the other three, and I liked using three fighter types. This game allows you to do that too, though I think magic is considerably more effective than it was in the previous games. And this was a really needed change, and I think it balanced the power of special attacks with the magic spells very effectively. Another new innovation of Star Ocean The Last Hope's combat is the Rush Gauge. This is a new meter that builds as you do and take damage. When it reaches 100%, you can activate Rush Mode, which allows you to execute special Rush combos that deal huge amounts of damage. I actually didn't find the need to use this very often, but it was a fun way to amplify my attacks in key moments. Lastly, there are now Blindside Attacks, which allow players to counter-attack enemies targeting them. When you successfully use a blindside, your character will step behind the enemy and launch his or her own attack. You can do blindsides by pressing and holding the jump command while the player character is targeted. There is one problem though. If you hold the button too long, you'll get fatigued and it won't work at all. And honestly, this was pretty frustrating. It actually took quite a bit of practice to master, but if you get good at it, you can really avoid a lot of big hits and deal damage at the same time. I'll never complain about that in an RPG, that's for sure. Unlike all the other Star Ocean games, this one is a prequel and takes place before the events of the first title. It takes place on Earth in the year 2096, after the mass destruction of World War III, which completely devastated the planet. The two warring factions eventually organized a ceasefire and created a global governing body called the Greater United Nations in 2065. 31 years later and you take control of Edge Maverick, a member of the Space Reconnaissance Force. As a crew member of the Kalnis, his mission is to help the organization seek out other hospitable worlds to find a new home for humanity. If you've ever seen the movie Interstellar, there's definitely some of those vibes here. Soon after the game begins, everything gets thrown into chaos and the Kalnis is forced to crash land on a planet called Eos. You soon find out that two other ships, the Balena and the Dent Delian, also landed there. Previously undetected life forms begin to attack though, and Edge is the only one of the Kalnis crew that isn't seriously injured. He's then sent with Raimi, his second in command, to explore the planet and seek out the other two crashed ships. So yeah, the start of this game was about what you'd expect from a Star Ocean game. You're in a technologically driven world, but something goes awry right at the start. I will say though that I found the story in this one to be much, much heavier on the sci-fi elements than previous Star Ocean games. And this didn't bother me at all, because I actually thought of it as a natural evolution of the franchise because all the previous titles had some sci-fi stuff thrown in. So leaning more heavily on that aspect made sense and it worked for me. Star Ocean The Last Hope features nine playable characters, each of which has their own fighting style. My personal favorite was FaZe, a green-haired dude who's actually kind of a melee fighter and symbologist hybrid. He also has a lot of interesting storyline moments, and I really liked his cool and collected personality. As far as the characters go, there's plenty of party combinations to explore, and like all other Star Ocean games, you're always incentivized to test out new attacks and spells to find out which ones work best for you. That part of the game was just as fun here as it was in the other Star Ocean games. In fact, that's probably the highlight of the series for me. Star Ocean fans won't be surprised whatsoever to learn that Motoi Sakuraba served as the composer, bringing 71 new tracks forward for The Last Hope. Cosmic Voyagers kind of stood out to me as a main theme of sorts that frames the game. The main battle theme, Blood on the Keys, is one you'll be hearing a ton for obvious reasons, but was also really well made. My personal favorite track is called Brilliant Rose, which is the theme that plays during the final dungeon. It's a brilliant clash of piano, bass, and synthesizers. Definitely Sakuraba at his best. This is a solid soundtrack overall that really stands out among its counterparts and is definitely one of my favorite PS3 soundtracks. One of the best parts of Star Ocean The Last Hope is that it's available on Steam right now. 
In fact, it's the only Star Ocean game available there outside of Star Ocean The Divine Force. And this is the best way to play it today because it's actually a 4K HD remastered version with vastly improved graphics. Outside of that, I didn't really notice any added content from the original, but it's certainly visually pleasing and really holds up well. Also, I've noticed the price of this is often reduced during Steam sales, so put it on your watch list today. So yes, I do think Star Ocean The Last Hope is one of the very best RPGs for the PlayStation 3 and Xbox 360. In fact, it's one of the few RPGs on those platforms that resisted the urge to innovate to such an extent it became unrecognizable. That's to say it didn't morph into a totally action-oriented style and alienate existing fans. And there's a lot to be said for that. It's true that the Star Ocean series always included a hybrid action style, but it retained that same form and made the series so unique to RPG fans. It really should be commended for sticking to that formula for better or worse. Star Ocean The Last Hope is also packed with bonus content in the form of item creation and bonus dungeons that you've come to expect from it. My only true critique of this game is that the AI for some of the characters is rough and can be frustrating at times. But you can work around this to some extent by tweaking the settings and doing things like turning certain spells off. I can forgive that part and applaud this one for its fun combat, solid characters, and interesting story. By the release of Star Ocean The Last Hope in 2009, the Star Ocean franchise was probably one of the most widely recognized RPG series in the world. Its creator Triace was praised for packing insane amounts of content into each and every Star Ocean game, and The Last Hope was pretty well received. However, the series went dormant for a long length of time. This was because franchise producer Yoshinori Yamagishi left Triace, and the company's overall investment in the series wasn't certain. Unbeknownst to many though, the original creator of the Star Ocean series, Yoshiharu Gotanda, began working in secret on a new follow-up with remaining members of the Star Ocean team. The project was the basis for Star Ocean Integrity and Faithlessness, which was released on the PlayStation 4 in 2016. Producer Shuichi Kobayashi worked tirelessly on the title and said he hoped it would draw its core essence from Star Ocean till the end of time. But did it live up to the previous titles in the series? I'll give you my take on that in this video, but before I do, please like it and subscribe to my channel for more retro gaming content. Star Ocean Integrity and Faithlessness takes place in the middle of the Star Ocean timeline, between Star Ocean The Second Story and Star Ocean Till the End of Time. While humanity is on the verge of peace, war stirs on the planet of Fey Creed IV, where two kingdoms fight against each other and mercenaries from a third kingdom possess technologically advanced weapons that can kill in mass numbers. You play as Fidel, but no, that's not the right Fidel. The Fidel you play as is caught up in it all along with his childhood friend Mickey. The two attempt to secure aid from the Rizulian army, which Fidel's father Daryl commands, but their request is denied because men are needed to fight against the kingdom of Traker. The story branches off from there, and there's a heck of a lot of characters, mostly forgettable ones, that you recruit along the way. Honestly, I found character development to be pretty darn lacking in this one. I thought a few of the characters were better than the ones in The Last Hope, but they just weren't as lovable as ones in the earlier Star Ocean games. Even the big moments it offers, like a major character death, didn't have a very profound effect on me. I just couldn't get invested in it. Star Ocean Integrity and Faithlessness doesn't revolutionize Star Ocean's battle system, but it does allow you to fight with more characters at one time than in any other game in the series. In this one, six characters are running around the screen and fighting all at the same time, and it really can be difficult to keep track of it all and follow what's happening, unless you're super meticulous. There's also a seventh character slot that can include another AI character that will join you along your adventure, but you can't control those. You can switch between the other six, though. The rush gauge is here too, and that works pretty similarly to how it did in The Last Hope and it allows you to unleash powerful special attacks. Combat takes place as you run around and encounter enemies, 
and there's a pretty seamless transition into battles, so that part was pretty new for the Star Ocean series. What I did enjoy about the battle system is that it goes back to the old school Star Ocean formula for special attacks. This means you can assign two short range attacks to the L1 and R1 buttons, and two long range attacks to the L1 and R1 buttons. And I have to say that as an old school Star Ocean player, this is a facet I really like because it was so fun to create and execute combos against enemies just like I did in the old days. I also enjoyed the roles system, which allows you to equip roles on AI controlled characters. These roles give each character a subset of abilities that define how they act in battle, and it was actually really fun to customize them and upgrade them with SP. Roles can utilize both active and passive abilities, and it was a lot of fun to play around with different combinations. The pacing of the game's story is quite odd because some scenes have these weird paces between dialogue lines that make you wonder if the scene is actually over or not. Besides that, the dialogue itself is often downright unimaginative. And if that wasn't bad enough, dialogue is routinely given during the battles themselves which I have to admit was an interesting idea, but it wasn't really executed well because, well, if you pay too close attention to it, you can get wiped out by enemies. The real shining star of this game is Motoi Sakuraba's soundtrack, whose work sounds fantastic as always. However, there's a catch here that's really disappointing, and that's that almost half of the game's songs are from Star Ocean Till the End of Time and Star Ocean The Last Hope and just reused here. And honestly, that's pretty darn disappointing for a fan expecting a full new suite of tunes. The new stuff that is here is great, there's just not enough of it. Many fans believe this title to be the black sheep of the franchise, and on the surface it's pretty easy to see why. Unlike The Last Hope, which was filled with story cutscenes, Star Ocean Integrity and Faithlessness had none at all, which certainly surprised a lot of fans. However, there are long, drawn-out, unskippable dialogue sequences between characters, something which drew criticism from reviewers like IGN and Game Informer. Also, the game's text is just way, way too small, and it's hard to read unless you're so close to your television or monitor and that part is just dreadful. I like the return to classic combat mechanics and the role system, both of which are things that worked well, but the characters and story just didn't do it for me. I don't think Star Ocean Integrity and Faithlessness is quite as bad as some people say, but I also think it's fair to call it the worst mainline Star Ocean game. But hey, if you like the series a lot, I think you'll actually like this one too. But if you're looking to break into the Star Ocean franchise for the first time, I would start with one of the first three instead. When Star Ocean The Divine Force was first announced in October of 2021, I was actually pretty darn surprised. And that's because the previous title in the franchise, Integrity and Faithlessness, was widely viewed as a flop, and it was tough times for developer Triace afterwards. For a while, it wasn't even clear whether the company would shelve the series for good or not. But now that it's been out for a while, I thought I'd give Star Ocean The Divine Force a true try and see if it managed to capture some of the essence of the old Star Ocean games, and if it truly represented a step forward for the series. In this video, I'm going to give you my impressions of just about every aspect of the game, which is now out for PS4, PS5, Steam, and Xbox platforms. But before I do that, please like this video and subscribe to my channel for more retro gaming and RPG content. At the beginning of the game, you choose between two protagonists, Raymond and Laetitia. And having this choice really reminded me of the way Star Ocean The Second Story worked. The two storylines sometimes play out in different places, and the two are in different locations in many parts of the game, but the overarching story is generally the same. As far as the story itself goes, the captain of a merchant vessel named Raymond, who has a killer mullet by the way, gets separated from his crew when his vessel gets gunned down by a pan-galactic battleship. After escaping on a pod, he lands on the underdeveloped planet of Aster IV, where he's immediately caught up in a struggle between kingdoms. It's there where he meets Laetitia, the princess of one of them. 
He agrees to help her in the fight against their adversaries in the Vale Empire in exchange for assistance finding his stranded fellow crew members. When you dive right into Star Ocean The Divine Force, the first thing you'll notice is that the whole combat system deviates a lot from the previous Star Ocean games. This is because instead of an action RPG hybrid where you select combat commands, this one embraces a full action style that will be familiar to you if you play games like Dark Souls and Final Fantasy VII Remake. It's a much more free roaming system and the transition between traveling and getting into battles is virtually seamless, if that makes sense. The battles feature a chain combo system where you expend AP to perform attacks. You can assign three combat skills to square, triangle, and circle buttons, and pressing a single button in succession unleashes a several step combo. There's a pretty good variety of special attacks you can acquire over time, and I liked how they were specific to each character. In addition, you can also assign passive skills to your characters to assist them in battle once you unlock them. The Divine Force also revives the blindside system from Star Ocean The Last Hope which allows you to dominate enemies by catching them from behind. So if you manage to strike them while their eyes are turned away from you, you'll temporarily stun them and your characters can wail away at them easily. If speedy clearing is your thing, this combat system will be refreshing compared to a lot of the turn-based or quasi-turn-based games, but it just didn't do it for me. Even though the damage you do to enemies is still present in the form of numbers, I feel that that's one of the only factors that make the combat RPG-like at all. I know this kind of combat style is just the way things are in modern gaming, but I'm really, really not a big fan of that decision. I think it'll just end up alienating much of the fan base, though I do admit it might draw a few new fans in as well. I do have to admit though, the skill system is pretty fun. In this one you gain SP from battles just like in any other Star Ocean game, but you spend them on a skill tree that works a lot like the Sphere Grid from Final Fantasy X or the License Board from Final Fantasy XII. By way of this mechanic, the player is given a lot of choice over how they want their character to develop. You can go for the combat or passive skills first, or you can build stats or resistances instead. Each of these choices involves significant risks that you'll need to account for, and the decisions feel like tangible ones. They actually have big effects on your characters. I also thought the way the game handles exploration and quick traveling was interesting, because early in the game the party discovers a robot-like being called the Duma, and its powers actually allow you to launch yourself forward across the battlefield. With the touch of a button, your character can traverse the map super quickly, but you can also use it to launch yourself vertically as well, and that's pretty useful for finding treasures and getting to certain areas. You can also use the Duma to score surprise attacks against enemies, so its usage is pretty versatile. You even obtain Duma shards throughout the game that allow you to upgrade the machine's capabilities and increase your power. And now for the game's cardinal sin, the text size. The text in Star Ocean The Divine Force is so ridiculously small, it's hard to read if you're any distance away from your television at all, and there's no way to change it. This makes the game's text and menus almost unusable, and it really makes the experience a big drag. I originally started playing the game on my big screen television, but when I realized this issue, I was forced to switch to my computer monitor instead so I could actually see it. This problem is even more disappointing when you consider the fact that the text in Star Ocean Integrity and Faithlessness was super small too, and that attracted a lot of negative feedback as well. This issue is truly annoying, it's a total shame, and it makes the game semi-unplayable. Motoi Sakuraba is back on duty for the soundtrack, and it's absolutely huge. At 99 tracks, this is the biggest score in the history of the franchise, and it's actually of high quality too. It contains the same orchestrated style that will be familiar to you, with lots of strings and horns for all the story's dramatic moments. But I was pleased to see that there is some experimentation here too, in styles that I didn't know the composer was capable of. Endless Journey is a great example of this. It uses what sounds like a Spanish guitar and a flute of some kind, and it's probably one of my favorite tunes on the whole soundtrack. Unlike Integrity and Faithlessness, it doesn't reuse a ton of songs from the previous Star Ocean games either, 
and that was super refreshing as well. In the end, my opinions on Star Ocean The Divine Force are pretty mixed. The combat system is great for fans of action games, but it won't do it for many fans of the older Star Ocean titles. The characters and story were interesting enough for me, especially toward the end of the game, and the themes and motif are exactly what I would have expected from a game in this franchise. The soundtrack and skill system are great, and traveling and exploration wasn't nearly as tedious as it is in many other games. Some people consider this a return to form for the series of sorts, and maybe in some ways it is. Over integrity and faithlessness, I think it certainly is. But I can't really say it is for me. In my mind, it's a far better game than integrity and faithlessness, but I'll take the first four mainline Star Ocean games over this one any day of the week. Recently, Square Enix announced that they are remaking yet another beloved RPG, Star Ocean The Second Story. Set to be released on Switch, PlayStation 4, PlayStation 5, and Steam on November 2nd, Star Ocean The Second Story R is destined to become one of the most talked about retro RPGs released in years. And to my surprise, they're actually making a lot of visual changes to the game. I was able to dive into the game recently, so I wanted to let you all know my thoughts on it. I've already reviewed the original game for the channel, so this video will focus primarily on what I liked and disliked about this newly remade version of the game. As always, for more retro gaming content and classic RPG reviews like this one, please like this video and subscribe to my channel. Square Enix did give me a free copy of this game to play, but all the opinions in this video are mine alone, and no money exchanged hands. The first thing that jumps out about Star Ocean The Second Story R is the totally revamped visual style. Gone are the totally pre-rendered backgrounds in the original game, replaced with 3D-like backgrounds that are being marketed as 2.5D. There are also a lot of lighting effects, distance changes, and layers of scenery that give each area a true sense of depth, so this will have a fresh appearance to old players of the game while still not devolving too much from the original essence of it. And I just have to say I think the game looks great. It's honestly a true pleasure to look at and it doesn't feel out of place. The way the backgrounds clash with the sprites reminds me a little bit of Octopath Traveler but without the HD 2D blurring effects. I'm also super glad that they kept the original sprites in this one, including in battle, so they'll really preserve a lot of the nostalgia we all have for this game. In addition, I can't stress enough how happy I am that they didn't just apply a filter to the edge of the sprites. I hated how this was done in games like the Grandia remaster, because the sprites just look blurry and ugly in that one. Not here though, because Square Enix did a superb job by preserving the most important part to preserve. The title's main story is fully voice acted too, and it seemed to be pretty professionally done. The character portraits that appeared during dialogue were also well made, and look exactly as I would expect them to. I'm personally not a big fan of having their mouths move during the dialogue, but I suppose bringing that up is nitpicking a bit. I would also say that the text size and interface font is the perfect style and size, unlike some other games out there. <clears throat> Star Ocean The Divine Force <clears throat> The combat in Star Ocean The Second Story R wasn't tweaked too much compared to the original game, and in my mind that's actually a pretty good thing because it was honestly fun the way it was. However, there are a few changes, including a timing-based counterattack system that allows you to jump behind an enemy and attack while recovering a small amount of magic points. Enemies also have shield values that appear as icons above their head, and when you break enemy shields, all of your party's attacks become critical hits. So this was a very fun mechanic that reminded me a bit of the break system from Octopath Traveler, and it definitely added a new and fun dimension to the game. So yeah, the battles are great, and that's something that worried me a little bit going into this because some of these remakes just try to do too much to the battles. But here, they're even more fun than the original, and all the same attacks you love and remember are here. The best part of the whole experience is that, while they added a few new dynamics to make combat more interesting, the combat itself still preserves the original feel. And hey, as far as I see it, that's exactly what they should have been shooting for. 
and speaking of new stuff, Square Enix also threw far more into this remake than I would have expected. For instance, there are these new raid enemies that appear on the map that you can track down and defeat for special rewards, and they're far more powerful than regular foes too, so it's definitely another thing to keep you busy. There's also instigation points that appear as beams of light that appear all over the world, and when you approach them, you receive special items and experience points. They've even thrown fishing into the game, and this seems to work a lot like it does in the Breath of Fire titles. What I've heard so far of the remastered soundtrack is off the charts awesome too. They're the same songs you remember, all arranged by original composer Motoi Sakuraba himself, and remastered with a live orchestra. So these tunes weren't simply remastered, they were fully remade. And if that wasn't enough, there's even some new songs he created for this game as well. I haven't heard those yet, but I'm certainly excited to. I haven't played completely through the game yet, but Star Ocean The Second Story R seems to be, in many ways, the ideal remake for retro RPG fans like myself. Square Enix simply didn't skimp out on anything here. They added some new combat mechanics that are fun, an awesome graphical overhaul that makes the world feel so much bigger, quite a bit of bonus content, and even new songs. So yes, in my mind, this was remade perfectly for the style of game it was, just like Live Alive was. This was because they didn't try to reinvent the wheel or revolutionize the game into something it wasn't or should never be. They just added good changes but kept the spirit of the original game the same. So much so that I hope Square Enix decides to remake games like Bahamut Lagoon and Treasure of the Rudras in a similar fashion. So yeah, this is definitely the best way to play Star Ocean The Second Story, so forget about the original and PSP versions from here on out. Ever since its inception in 1996, the Star Ocean series has certainly left an impression upon its fans and the RPG landscape in general. As far as RPG franchises go, it's probably one of the most well-known outside of the Final Fantasy and Dragon Quest universes. And honestly, it's kind of easy to see why. I think there are two major reasons for this. First, Star Ocean is distinct for blending science fiction with all the fantasy tropes you're probably familiar with if you've played other RPGs. And sure, Star Ocean games aren't the only ones that have done this, but it's certainly one of the most recognizable series for having done so. Secondly, Star Ocean's battle system really stood out, especially in the first few titles when strictly turn-based games were the norm for RPGs. To combine the turn-based style with action-based movement and special attacks was truly innovative, and it really made this series more dynamic and gameplay-focused than nearly all of its counterparts. Of course, there are many other things that stand out about it, like the item creation system and loads of bonus content, and it's truly remarkable how much replay value this series offers compared to most RPGs. As to whether we'll get a new Star Ocean sometime in the future, well, that remains to be seen. As I noted in this video, series developer Trice has gone through some tough times in recent years. Star Ocean Integrity and Faithlessness was widely considered a flop, and Star Ocean The Divine Force may not have sold as many copies as Square Enix may have hoped. But it may not all be doom and gloom. Star Ocean The Second Story R was recently released, and it truly has the chance to breathe new life into the franchise. In fact, fans that first discovered a love for retro RPGs because of games like Octopath Traveler and Tactics Ogre Reborn may just be inspired by Star Ocean in the same way us longtime fans once were. If sales are good enough, and there's enough interest in the fanbase, we'll all benefit. But even if we never do, Star Ocean is still worth celebrating for what it is. Whether for the unique hybrid of science fiction and fantasy, the innovative and fun combat system, or the amazing soundtrack, the franchise continues to live on in the hearts of its fans. Maybe, just maybe, there's even more to come from this illustrious series in the future. So what were your favorite aspects or memories about the Star Ocean series? And which game in the franchise do you think was the best? Let me know in a comment below. 
please like, subscribe, and click the bell for more retro gaming content. Also, big shout out to my Patreon patrons and YouTube members, I really appreciate your support. If you want early access to the videos I produce and other perks like they receive, please consider supporting the channel by becoming a Patreon patron or via the YouTube join feature.